Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through the process of valuing JP Morgan stock so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. JP Morgan Chase is a financial services company. It is the world's largest bank in terms of market cap. They are a major provider of investment banking services through corporate advisory, mergers and acquisitions, sales and trading, and public offerings. The company's private banking franchise and asset management division are among the world's largest in terms of total assets. Their retail banking and credit card offerings are provided via the Chase brand in the US and the UK. The company is headquartered in New York, New York and was founded in 1799. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 410 billion market cap. They're trading at 140 a share and they have 2.9 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. A big negative in 2020. In 2021, a big improvement of 78 billion, then over 100 billion in 2022, and the trailing 12 months is 38 billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that jumps up a lot from 2020 to 2021 dropping in 2022 to 38 billion. It's 42 billion in a trailing 12 months. Their revenue is interest income and fees, and that was 119 billion in 2020. It grows each year up to 136 billion in a trailing 12 months. This is their most recent income statement, the first quarter of 2023 versus the first quarter of 2022. Let's go through their revenue. They earn lots of fees, investment banking fees of 1.6 billion. That is down from 2022 of 2 billion. Principal transactions is up a lot, 7.6 billion compared to 5.1 billion. Here is a breakdown of the 7.6 billion from principal transactions. And all these numbers are fees from trading revenue. People trade commodities, equity, that's like stock trading, foreign exchange and interest rate hedging. Credit 634 million, foreign exchange 1.6 billion, equity 2.7 billion, and commodities 900 million. They generated 1.6 billion from lending and deposit fees, 3.5 billion from asset management fees. The lending and deposit fees of 1.6 billion, 369 million is lending related, 1.25 billion deposit related. The 3.5 billion of asset management fees, 3.4 billion from investment management fees, and 75 million from other. Asset management fees are related to managing assets for their clients. If you're watching this video, you probably manage your own assets. It's pointless to pay somebody, just put all your money into S&P 500. The S&P 500 beats most asset managers and investment advisors. 1.7 billion from commissions, an investment loss of 868 million, mortgage fees of 221 million, the commissions of 1.7 billion, 750 million from brokerage commissions, 557 million from admin fees, and 391 million from other. Here's a breakdown of the loss of 868 million, a realized gain of 131 million, a realized loss of 999 million. These gains and losses are related to held to maturity and available for sale securities. We'd have to dig into the 10Q a little more to find the exact securities. But the dollar amount is pretty small relative to their revenue, so we'll just move on. Let's look at the 221 million of mortgage fees and related income. A bulk of that is loan servicing revenue of 400 million. Also production revenue of 75 million. Then there's some adjustments and that brings it down to 221 million. They have 1.2 billion of card income and 1 billion of other income. For credit cards, 7 billion of interest and fees minus 5.5 billion of rewards. That's how they come up with 1.2 billion. For other income, this includes operating lease income as well as losses with the firm's tax-oriented investments. It's mainly alternative energy equity method investments. Leave a comment if you want me to explain further what equity method accounting is. I do explain it in a bunch of videos but for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip the explanation for this. And this is directly from their 10Q. They cut off some words. You could tell what it is. 
They miss the O here for operating lease income. This should be losses on tax-oriented investment and gain related to the acquisition of CIFM. I'll show you the 10Q. This is the 10Q from their website. So you can see here, they cut it off. JPM is a Goliath. They generated 17 billion on non-interest revenue. The way banks typically make money is on interest income. You deposit money into your JPM account. You put $10,000 into the account. They pay you 1% interest. Then they take that $10,000 and loan it to someone else and charge them 9% interest and their spread, their profit is 8%. That's how banks generally make money. They do make more money on interest income, but not that much more. Most banks, over 90% of their revenue is from interest income. The rest is from fees. JPM received 37 billion of interest income from their loans, and they paid 16.2 billion of interest expense on the money deposited. Let me give you a breakdown of this number so you know exactly what it is. Here's the 37 billion of interest income, and then down here is the 16 billion of interest expense. So the net interest income, or their profit, is 20.7 billion. Of the 37 billion, 18 billion is loans. They loan money to people to buy homes, to buy cars, or some people take personal loans to maybe fix up their home. 4 billion of taxable securities, 248 million of non-taxable. So total investment securities is 4.2 billion. That 4.2 billion is the 4 billion plus the 248 million. Then they have trading assets, debt instruments of 3.6 billion. To give you an example of what this might be, it could be treasury bonds, mortgage-backed securities. These are investments JPM holds to sell for at a profit at a future time. So instead of holding cash, which really doesn't pay much interest, they buy these fairly safe liquid securities to make a little return on. Federal funds of 3.1 billion, securities borrowed of 1.7 billion. Deposits with banks, this is money JPM deposited in another bank because it's income for them, 4.8 billion. These aren't the funds that people deposited with JP Morgan. That's on the expense side. So total interest income is 37 billion. Interest bearing deposits 7.6 billion. I have my money deposited at Chase. This 7.6 billion is not the money I have deposited at Chase. This is the interest they paid me. In the first quarter of 2023, they paid me $500 of interest for keeping money in my savings account. My $500 is part of this 7.6 billion. Fed funds purchase and loan 2.8 billion. That's tied to the 3.1 billion of income up here. Sometimes banks need more money than what's deposited at the bank. So they go to the Fed and borrow from them, and then they lend that money out. They pay two billion on trading liabilities. They pay 3.3 billion on their long-term debt. This is their balance sheet, long-term debt of 249 billion. That's the principal amount of the debt. The interest they paid is 3.3 billion. 147 million on variable interest entities. So the total interest JPM paid was 16.3 billion. Their interest income is 20.7 billion. They have to post a provision for credit losses because sometimes people don't pay back their loans. That's 2.3 billion. After the credit losses, they have a profit of 18.4 billion, which is roughly half of the interest income. So really good margins, about 50%. So their revenue in the first quarter is 38 billion, up from 31 billion. They posted a 2.3 billion provision for credit losses. That's not how much money people defaulted on their loans. That's just a provision. That's money they're setting aside. So it could be a lot more or a lot less than 2.3 billion. Because this amount should be reversed out on a statement of cash flows. And it might show the true amount on a statement of cash flows. Or we might have to dig into the 10Q a little more to figure it out. Compensation expense is their largest expense at 11.7 billion. And I'm sure you guessed what compensation expense is, it's payroll. And the reason for the increase was driven by additional headcount, mainly in technology and operations, also in their front office, and the impact of wage inflation. And that's partially offset by lower revenue in CIB. That stands for Corporate and Investment Banking Research. Occupancy expense, the cost to lease all their locations, 1.1 billion. Technology, communications, and equipment, 2.2 billion. Professional and outside services, 2.4 billion. An example of this is legal help. 
marketing 1 billion, all those TV commercials really add up, and other 1.6 billion. So non-interest expense of 20 billion, income before tax is 16 billion, taxes of 3.3 billion, net income of 12.6 billion. That's up from 8.3 billion. That gives them an EPS of 411, much higher than last year of 264. And they had 2.977 billion shares outstanding last year. In the first quarter of 2023, they have 8.5 million less shares than last year, 2.968 billion. Let's go through all the slides on their first quarter earnings presentation. The first slide shows their last five quarters. So total revenue is highest in the first quarter of 2023. It was flat from the first quarter to the second quarter of 2022. It jumped up two billion from the second quarter to the third quarter, jumped up another two billion to the fourth quarter, and jumped up four billion in this most recent quarter. They have their best net income in the first quarter of 2023, 12.6 billion. That's up about 50% from the same quarter last year. Their EPS is over $4 for the first time in the past five quarters. It was $264 last year in 2022. Their shares outstanding are pretty flat quarter to quarter. It is down a tiny bit from the first quarter of 2022 to the current quarter. It is up a little bit from last quarter. Their market cap was higher a year ago, over $400 billion. Now it's $380 billion. This chart is as of 331, but I'm making this video on June 3rd and their market cap is higher than $400 billion. Book value per share is an important number to look at when valuing banks. That's highest at 94. Tangible book value is also highest at 77. They're paying $1 in dividends. They paid that same amount the last five quarters. ROE is net income over equity. That's highest at 18%. Return on tangible equity is also highest at 23%. ROA is net income over assets. It's how well you use your assets to generate a profit. That's also highest at 1.38%. Loans to deposit ratio, that's under 50%, which is really good. The number one reason banks go bankrupt is they loan more money out than is deposited at the company. An ideal LDR is 80 to 90%. JPM is around 50%, which is great. One of the banks that recently went bankrupt, not Silicon Valley, maybe Signature, I think they loaned out more than 100% of what was deposited there. 580 billion of trading assets, the highest ever. 1.1 trillion dollars of loans. 3.7 trillion of total assets. I didn't misspeak, it is trillion. 2.4 billion of deposits, that's how much money is deposited at the bank. They did have more last year, 2.6 trillion. That's not a great sign when deposits go down. Even though it's a huge number, 2.4 trillion, you don't want to see it go down. And I thought JPM took over Silicon Valley when they were put into receivership. Because when the FDIC takes over a bank like Silicon Valley or Signature, they have to find another bank to take those deposits. They have to find another bank to take that bank's customers. And JPM is usually top of the list for a bank that takes over a failing bank. They have seven and a half billion of non-performing assets, a lot better than last year of 8.6 billion. Charge-offs of 1.1 billion, that's double last year. So their net charge-off rate is 43 basis points. Let's look at their slide on consumer and community banking. Revenue of 16.5 billion, which is 4.3 billion higher than the first quarter of 2022. 660 million higher than last quarter. Of that 16 billion, 10 billion is banking and wealth management, 700 million in home lending, Credit card and auto is 5.7 billion. Expenses of 8 billion, so their net income is 5.2 billion, up 2.3 billion from last year. Look at that ROE, 40%. It was 23% last year. It's a really profitable quarter in this area. 450 billion of loans in this category, 1.1 trillion in deposits, 51 million mobile customers, up 5 million from last year. 387 billion in debit and credit card volume. Just massive numbers. Their net income of 5.2 billion is up 80% year over year. Revenue of 16.5 billion up 35%. Expenses of 8 billion up only 5%. Net charge-offs of 1.1 billion up half a billion. In banking and wealth management, 20 billion of loans, that's down from 25 billion. Home lending, 172 billion. 
If you want to buy a home and you get your mortgage through Chase, that's home lending. That's also down from last year of $176 billion. Credit cards is $181 billion, up from $149 billion. This is their corporate and investment bank slide. Revenue of $13.6 billion. That's total banking of $4.2 billion, plus markets and security services, $9.4 billion. For total banking, $1.6 billion in investment banking, $2.4 billion in payments, and $267 million in lending. They have $5.7 billion of revenue from fixed income, $2.7 billion from equity, $1.1 billion from securities. Total expenses of $7.5 billion, net income of $4.4 billion. Their net income of $4.4 billion is up 1% year over year. Investment banking revenue is down 24%. Payments revenue is up 26%. Lending revenue down 17%. Markets revenue down 4%. Fixed income is flat. Equity markets is down 12%. Security services up 7%. And expenses are only up 2%. That's reflecting higher compensation, including headcount growth and wage inflation largely offset by lower revenue related compensation. Let's look at their commercial banking slide. 3.5 billion of revenue, 1.7 billion from middle market banking. Middle market banking is providing banking services to customers with revenues in the 50 million to $1 billion range. Corporate client banking is 1.2 billion. Commercial real estate, 642 million. Those are up about 10% or more from last year. Expenses of 1.3 billion. So net income of 1.3 billion, up half a billion. Net income up 58% year over year. Revenue up 46% year over year. Expenses are up more in this category, up 16% year over year. But revenue is up 46%, so that's fine. They lent out $238 billion in this category. That's up 13% year over year, up 1% quarter over quarter. Commercial and industrial loans up 18% year over year. Commercial real estate up 8% year over year. And the average deposits of 266 billion down 16% year over year and down 5% quarter over quarter. That's driven by attrition and seasonally low balances. Let's look at their asset and wealth management slide. Revenue of 4.8 billion, asset management 2.4 billion, global private bank 2.4 billion. Expenses of 3 billion, net income of 1.4 billion which is up 36% year over year. Revenue of 4.8 billion, up 11% year over year. Expenses are up 8% year over year. Assets on the management of 3 trillion, up 2%. And client assets of 4.3 trillion, up 6%. They loaned out 211 billion in this category, down 1%. They have 224 billion in deposits, that's down 22%. Let's look at their capital structure, 300 billion of equity, 480 billion of debt. They're 39% equity, 61% debt. Net debt, negative 380 billion. I gave them a whack of 10.8% and that's the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value to all cash flows past year four, that's 558 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $504 billion. We divide that by 2.9 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 173. They're trading at 140, so they're trading at a 19% discount. It's a buy according to the model. It is hard to value a bank using a DCF model. There's a lot of other things you need to look into, like the price to book, the price of tangible book, the percent of deposits they have loaned out, their investment securities. That's what hurts Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of factors to consider. Simply Wall Street's at 201, they say the stock is 30% undervalued. 17 analysts price this stock and the average price target is 162, the low is 145, the high is 196. Another 23 analysts price this stock and the average price target is 160, they say the stock is 14% undervalued. This is where the stock has been trading the last 20 years. The stock was hit real hard during the dot com crash. That was pretty close to the time they lost a lot of money on Enron. They loaned a lot of money to Enron, and of course they didn't get it back because Enron filed bankruptcy. It looks like the stock got down to about $10 at its low. And then over the next four years, it ran up past $50. Then the Great Recession hit, it fell back down to about $15. Then it took another four years to get back up to 50. That's in the beginning of 2013. It hit 100 by mid 2017, 
but then it crashed at COVID coming down to about 85. Then the stock doubled over the next year to 175. It almost hit $100 a few months back, but it's up about 40% since that bottom, sitting around 140. And of course, all this time through the ups and downs, you always get your dividend payment. They pay a quarterly dividend. It's been $1 for the past two years. That's a yield of 2.85%, 31% of their free cash flow, 28% of their net income. There are 13 companies in the same industry as JPM, and if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the median. Their debt to equity ratio is the same as the median. For every dollar of equity, they have $1.60 of debt. That is better than the average. They do pay a lower dividend than most companies on this list. I actually put a lot of money to new holdings a year or so ago. I'm up about 35, 40% on that. But look at NTB, almost 7%. Bank of Nova Scotia, over 6%. Their free cash flow is highest on this list at 38 billion. Of course, they're the largest company on this list. B of A is a distant second. Their price to book is equal to the average. That's market cap over book value. Their PE is a little worse than the median and average. That's market cap over earnings. Their price to free cash flow is between the median and average. That's market cap over free cash flow. And their price to sales is a little worse than the median and average. That's market cap over revenue. They generate the most revenue out of all the companies on this list. And they have the second highest five-year annual revenue growth rate of 6%. East West Bank is first at 12%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 19% discount. They've been around 224 years. Really long time. It's a really safe investment. You get your dividend payment. They're such a big bank. They're definitely too big to fail. And they're always acquiring these smaller banks. My first job out of college was working at Chase in the corporate headquarters in mortgage-backed securities. During the first year I worked there, Chase acquired JPM. It's not the other way around. JPM did not acquire Chase. Chase acquired JPM. And then in 2004, we acquired Bank One, another big acquisition. I thought we were going to change the name to J.P. Morgan Chase Bank One, but we didn't. We kept it at J.P. Morgan Chase. I always felt J.P. Morgan Chase should acquire Morgan Stanley because they share the Morgan. You could just add the Stanley. J.P. Morgan Stanley Chase. But I digress. I rank their free cash flow as 5 out of 10, their revenue 8 out of 10, and their ratio is 4 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give the video a like, subscribe, or comment below. If you want to get a custom valuation or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.